I couldn't believe some of the things they wrote about uh, the prequels, you know? I mean, but really, beyond, I didn't like it. <laughs> you ruined my childhood, and I'm still angry about the way they treated Jake Lloyd. He was only 10 years old, that boy, and he did exactly what George wanted him to do. Believe me, I understand clunky dialogue. So I almost got hornswoggled in that documentary where I, they weren't calling it the People versus George Lucas at the time, but I could tell from the questions they were asking me, they were, it was an open invitation to trash George. George Lucas raped a childhood. George Lucas raped our childhood. George Lucas raped our childhood. George Lucas raped a childhood. George Lucas raped our childhood. George Lucas raped our childhood. And I have issues with George, but I love that man. I you go to make a movie and all you do is get criticized and people try to make decisions about what you're going to do before you do it. You know, it's not much fun and you can't experiment. You can't do anything. You have to do it a certain way. I don't like that. I never did. I started out in experimental films and I want to go back to experimental films. But of course, nobody wants to see experimental films. The main thing is to protect these characters. Make sure that they still continue to, to live in the way that you created them. I'm curious that uh, the force doesn't get muddled into a bunch of garbly gook. Can I just say though, a lot of times I would say to Ryan, we got to think about the fans. And he said, no, we got to think about the story and we got to think about our movie. Which I, you know. fellow prequel fanboys and sane people so good to have you back this is part two of revenge of the prequels episode two before we begin i need to reiterate you need to go back and watch episode one to understand my motivation and purpose for making this series if you do not like the star wars prequels that's absolutely fine you still might find some enjoyment in this video series and i'm sure you can no doubt add to the discussion in the comments below and again, this is part two, so we are going to start in the middle of the video. So you're welcome to stay, but you might be a bit lost. Finally, someone brought this to my attention that our good friend Star Wars Only has decided to delete this video in its entirety. Ah, did I have something to do with it? It really wasn't my intention. I honestly do like Star Wars Only quite a bit. I, I just take issue with people saying stupid shit in general. And hell, I say stupid shit at times as well. No one's perfect. So with that said, fret not, because you know how I do things. I never leave a job half finished, and I never, ever not deliver on a promise made. Oh. Well, I'm going to deliver on this promise, so enjoy. Okay, so the love story in this is just horrible. I can't, oh my god, um, just so cringeworthy. And it's not even Hayden's fault. It's not even Natalie's fault. It's it's Lucas's. It's it's the writing. It's the whole. You're just like I remembered you in my dreams. What? Who says that? Um. Well, someone who is socially and romantically illiterate might say something that bold and stupid. You can blame the writing all you want, but the fact of the matter is the dialogue is consistent with the characters in question, based on their backstories and how they've been set up. Again, this isn't how real world people talk, so sure, it can be a bit jarring, but again, this isn't the real world. This is a fictional world where characters react and speak to one another differently. It really all comes down to execution and character consistency. Now, the character consistency is spot on, but the execution is where things start to get a bit hazy. You're in my very soul tormenting me. I don't think she liked me watching her. This is just so cringeworthy, and it's forced upon us, and it's just bad, and I have nothing against romance. I like some romance movies, but this is just so ugly and, like, horrible. I mean, it's just, it's very cringeworthy. I hate it, and, and it's really hard to defend this love story. It's just not good. Okay, right now, here is where I'm partially going to side with you. This is what I meant by execution. Despite many attempts in my mind to try and justify the fireplace scene between Anakin and Padme, it simply doesn't work, despite the characters being consistent with the dialogue. 
But saying, oh, it's cringeworthy, it's the worst thing ever, and I hated it, and George Lucas is a giant writing moronic hack, gets tiresome. So let me explain why it doesn't work. The reason is simply that Lucas took it a tad too far. It's very clear the romance was inspired by Shakespeare and classic stories of, of uh, forbidden love. And that's absolutely fine as long as you moderate it. The love story is a very classic love story of uh, forbidden love. Uh, two people who fall in love with each other when they really can't do that. Just about every other scene between Anakin and Padme has some level of moderation to it. Such as the dinner scene between the two of them where Anakin uses the force with the pear or the apple. The refugee scene where uh, they're having a conversation in the cantina. And the picnic scene where they're sitting by the waterfall discussing politics. I'm not mentioning the I like sand scene because that's a complicated one to break down. But yes, even that scene has some level of moderation to it with the Shakespearean elements. However, in the fireplace scene, Lucas tells Anakin to pour his heart out to Padme in a very over-the-top monologue to show his emotional confliction and how much pain he is in and how deeply he cares for her. That's not to say none of the lines work, but Hayden's monologue comes across as way over the top and over dramatic because it simply doesn't match the tone the movie has set up. The scene starts out romantic and heartfelt, but then jarringly shifts into something else, and it makes Hayden come across as unnecessarily overdramatic for the situation he's in. From the moment I met you, all those years ago, not a day has gone by when I haven't thought of you. And now that I'm with you again, I'm in agony. The closer I get to you, the worse it gets. I'm haunted by the kiss that you should never have given me. My heart is beating, hoping that that kiss will not become a scar. You are in my very soul, tormenting me. It's almost as if he's become the living embodiment of Leonardo DiCaprio from Romeo and Juliet. If you see that insanely over-the-top monologue he gives at Juliet's grave, you understand what I'm getting at. My love. My wife. Death that hath sucked the honey of thy breath hath had no power yet upon thy beauty. Thou art not conquered. Beauty's ensign that is crimson in thy lips and in thy cheeks. Death's pale flag is not advancing there. While some of the lines could have been toned down to resemble something more equivalent to Star Wars instead of Romeo and Juliet, I think a big part of why it doesn't work is because Anakin is monologuing in the first place. Reimagine this scene and how much more sensible and appropriate it would have been if it contained a challenging dialogue between the two characters and Anakin slowly began to emotionally break. The fact that Padme was quiet throughout the entire first half of the scene is very detrimental to what Lucas was trying to achieve. This is evident towards the end of the scene where the monologuing actually turns into a conversation that's much easier to digest. It'll take us to a place we cannot go, regardless of the way we feel about each other. Then you do feel something. I will not let you give up your future for me. You are asking me to be rational. That is something I know I cannot do. Believe me, I wish that I could just wish away my feelings, but I can't. I will not give in to this. Now, that's the short version, but do you see how much can be said in breaking down both positives and negatives in a few lines of dialogue? I could go more in depth regarding each individual line, but this is a response video, not a critique. It's never going to be good. So, the love story in this was just awful, and I don't ever want to talk about it again, and... I really wish it was never there, or at least it would have written out better. I don't know, but I don't like sand. Oh. Dude, saying nothing except I hate this over and over and over gets very draining after 11 seconds. Okay, let's be fair. You knew this one was coming. You knew Jar Jar had to be in there. We all knew it. We all predicted it. I even thought about it when I was making this damn video. Oh boy, here comes Jar Jar, the bane of every OT bitch boy's existence. Well... Maybe he's got something original to say, I hope. 
I was like, I, I don't want to put Jar Jar in there, but I got to put Jar Jar in there. He speaks for himself. Do I really need to go over this character? He has been voted the most hated character and most useless character in Star Wars. I don't hate him, you know, but he is annoying. And some people say that he's racist and everything, and I, I don't care about all that. But still, Jar Jar is here. Doesn't take off a lot from the movies. And George got smart and took him off further in. But God, he was so stupid. Okay, well, I'm glad to see you're not using that ridiculous Jar Jar represents George Lucas's racism argument that some sick-minded individuals pulled out of their penetrated assholes. Also, yeah, that whole useless character argument kind of got destroyed after the introduction of Rose and Holdo in The Last Jedi. But Jar Jar was never a useless character to begin with. Yes, he is clumsy by design. Yes, he is annoying by design. Not just to the audience, mind you, but the characters in the actual movie as well. And you know what? Despite all of this, he is actually very useful and has a contribution to the climax of the movie. Even if his actions in the big battle are comical to the point where you can't really take it seriously, Star Wars has always had that level of endearing ridiculousness in its action scenes. It's them! Blast them! Get back to the show! But that's a whole other topic. There are a number of purposes with Jar Jar in episodes 1 and 2 of the prequel trilogy, and they complement each other. I'll just go through his purpose in The Phantom Menace for the sake of this response. Jar Jar, by all accounts, should never have been found in the first place or undertaken the journey he went on in The Phantom Menace in the first place either. The fact that he did plays a huge role in the grand scheme of things, especially considering episode 2, but for episode 1, he's simply the fun, light-hearted, clumsy, comical character who's having trouble finding his place in the world, especially when his own people want nothing to do with him. By the end of the film, he hasn't really changed as a character, but he discovers that as long as he has a little bit of bravery, his people will accept him, and also that his clumsiness for destruction can be put to good use, especially when you consider the battle of the Gungans and the droids. Jar Jar was very clearly aimed at the younger audience, and that's a character they can surely connect with, and objectively, in terms of the film's writing, is not a useless character at all. But yeah, please, feel free to dislike him subjectively as much as you want. Other than the fact that Windu only brought four Jedi Masters to take out, you know, Sidious instead of calling Yoda and be like, hey, come help, uh, Sidious also takes out three of them within like five seconds, which is actually anticlimactic. It would have been amazing to see him fight four, four people at once. It's just kind of a bad scene, and yeah. Again, I agree and I disagree. The scene itself, unlike many of the other lightsaber duels, has a weakness because Ian McDermott had no training with a prop lightsaber prior to that point. Ian is a classical Shakespearean actor. You know, the last thing in the world that he can do or wants to do is be a Jedi Master. You know, he is not a Jedi Master. He's got to be even more powerful than the Jedi. You know, so it's not a, that was not a day that he relished. I knew we'd be shooting those scenes in about five days. So I didn't have that long with Nick uh, to get up to speed. We had to incorporate Ian into those sequences. We learned to move at a specific speed and sort of dexterousness that Ian just doesn't have yet because he wasn't focused on doing that. And then backing up. Yeah. But I didn't know he could use a lightsaber. And twice as fast. In fact, no, 500 times as fast as anyone else. And sometimes, you know, he would not be looking and I whacked him. You get hit. And those things hurt when you get hit. I think it really came off. I was very worried about it when we were shooting him and I know how uncomfortable Ian was. Both of them were. But I think they did a great job um, because it's a fight of close-ups. It's a fight of the two of them sensing who has got the greater strength. And then boom, you're right back in face to face with them. Great sequence. Which is why they had shot the scene the way they did and why in some areas it doesn't look very good. This was glaringly obvious with Ian McDermott's uh, choreography and facial expression that he did not know what the hell he was doing. Which is why it was kind of jarring when he killed those three Jedi in the manner that he did and why it felt so anticlimactic. The writing of the scene, the editing, and the post-production was all to compensate for McDermott. And this is detrimental to how the scene flows and how it looks. However, in terms of consistency for the character in question, it's spot on. There is no reason why the most powerful Sith alive, who has eluded the Jedi in plain sight for over a decade, wouldn't be able to dispatch lesser Jedi Masters with ease. Also, no. 
It's perfectly appropriate that Windu would bring that many Jedi as he doesn't entirely trust Anakin's loyalty due to his affection for Palpatine. The Clone Wars have spread the Jedi thin and there are only so many seasoned Jedi left who would stand a chance against Palpatine. If Windu had brought any more, they could have likely just gotten in the way. Sure, the film doesn't explain this, but due to the circumstances it has set up, it is a more than feasible assumption. Now one thing I will point out is I don't quite understand why Windu didn't at least contact Yoda before proceeding to confront Palpatine. Maybe to seek some guidance or whatever. But he did say that they needed to move quickly and remove him from power since Obi-Wan had just destroyed General Grievous. And Palpatine's emergency powers must finally, after a lengthy term in office, need to be returned to the Senate. Given that the Republic is meant to be a democracy, not a dictatorship. Could this have been written better? Yes. Does it make sense and hold up on its own? Yes. Moving on. So let's say you're watching the originals and you see Vader and you're like, God, this dude is a badass. Because that's what Vader is. No matter what you say, Vader is the badass in this saga, in this series, in Star Wars. He is the badass guy. He's like, God, dude, I fear him. And then you hear that he's a Jedi. You're like, Darth Vader was a Jedi? Man, I can't wait to see what he was like. Man, he's probably some badass pilot. He's probably some badass dude. Because Vader himself is a badass. So that means the Jedi version of him is badass as well, but he's good. He's looking out for the good, and something bad happened to him where he had to switch to the dark side. You know, that sounds great. Fine and dandy. I love that. Because Vader is the badass. But then you get over to the prequels, and what do you get? You get Hayden Christensen. You get Jake Lloyd where Vader's no longer the badass. Vader's just... He's Anakin Skywalker. And yes, Anakin Skywalker and Darth Vader are technically two different people. But the point still remains of, you watch the originals, and you go, this guy's a badass, and then you see him as a child, and you see him as a teenager, and he's a whiny bitch. <laughs> like, that's all I can really give him. Give him. It, it, it's, he's a whiny bitch, and that's it. Yeah, you and the many other OT fanboys who were butthurt that Vader wasn't a badass in the prequels, yet will still suck Plinkett's dick for his retarded black and white philosophy about character arcs, without realizing the same logic can be applied in reverse. Yes, Vader wasn't a badass in the prequels. In the prequels, he was an innocent, naive, impressionable slave boy. He then became a Jedi Padawan teenager. After said life of slavery, he was forced to abide by the Jedi Code, and strip himself of emotion and attachment to loved ones which he had already come to endear. That being his mother and, of course, Padme at the time. His conflicting emotions are the entire premise of Episode 2, and teenagers by nature are whiny brats. The entire argument against this is, oh, I didn't like Anakin in the prequels because he wasn't what Vader was supposed to be. I wouldn't have written Vader that way. And I have more of a right to write Darth Vader than the author does. Blah, blah, fucking blah. Fuck George Lucas. Now, with all that being said, you and Plinkett and the rest of Plinkett's fanboys will shit all over Qui-Gon and Darth Maul for not having character arcs or a backstory and deem their conflict to be worthless on those grounds alone. Even though you entirely missed the fucking point of what those characters' purposes are meant to serve. Anakin in the prequels is different from Darth Vader in the OT because... He is going through a character arc, you moronic fucks. I guess character arcs don't count when they directly contradict your fucking narrative. You and the rest of the OT fanboys will say we love Darth Vader because he's a badass, despite in A New Hope, both Darth Vader and Obi-Wan had little to no backstory whatsoever, as a matter of fact. By the end of the movie, we learn less about both those characters than we do about Qui-Gon Jinn. And no, re-watching A New Hope a million times doesn't change that. But you still like Darth Vader in A New Hope, right? Guess what? On those same grounds, I love Darth Maul and Mace Windu because they are badasses despite not knowing a goddamn thing about them. I also love Darth Vader in A New Hope despite being a generic evil guy in a cool suit of armor. But you know what gives this bland villain in A New Hope any character whatsoever? The fucking prequel trilogy. You can try and argue that episode 5 and 6 gave him some humanity, because yes, they certainly did, but by the end, what do we really know about Darth Vader? He turned evil, for reasons we don't know. He became disfigured, for reasons we don't know. The dark side is bad, he was once a Jedi, and he's Luke's dad, and that's it. We still don't know what the Jedi were, what the relationship with Obi-Wan was, 
and what the fuck the most powerful Jedi in existence is doing on a remote planet for many years, not helping against the galactic conflict. And of course, I'm referring to Yoda with that point. And it, especially in this scene right here, it completely kills the character of Vader to know that this, this, little, this little teenage boy becomes Darth Vader. And I know I can't expect much from a child or a teenager, but it still kills the character. Anakin Skywalker is not a badass. He is a whiny bitch. Vader is a badass that somehow, I don't know how your character can change from this little girl crying into I'm going to kill you because you got out of hyperspace too quickly. That, that It just doesn't add up in my opinion. So some people don't even talk about this, but for me it's something that really stood out and I've, I've always thought about, oh man, Vader's so cool and then he just kind of gets taken down a notch not even a notch it gets taken down like 10 levels by watching anakin being like i slaughtered them not just to win women but the children it's like what <laughs> it's it's cringeworthy yet again it is cringeworthy to watch this and to think about how how you know freaking darth vader's this little little bitch of a boy and i hate saying that but it's just true so I wish they would have made Anakin Skywalker be more of a badass, kind of like, you know, he was supposed to be compared to Darth Vader. Well, you didn't say too much that I didn't already cover, but you are very wrong about one thing in particular of what you just said. I'm going to paraphrase you here. Nobody seems to talk about this when it comes to the prequels, about what a whiny brat Anakin is and why it's terrible. No, everybody, every Plinkett fanboy and every OT nut writer has whined and bitched about the character of Anakin using the same retarded logic you just did. That's nothing new. In fact, it's very common amongst those people, but it's also very wrong. Again, feel free to hate Hayden Christensen's portrayal of Anakin as much as you want, but just because the consistent writing of the character disagrees with your perspective of what you dreamt up while watching the OT on repeat and walking down the fucking wedding aisle to that goddamn theme song, just because it wasn't a beat-for-beat -beat clone of what you had in your head doesn't make it objectively terrible. So... You're watching the original. It's 1980. Uh, you're watching The Empire Strikes Back. And you hear, no, I am your father. You're like, what? No, that's impossible. That's awesome. You're, you're like Luke. You're like, what? No. And it's so amazing. It's such a cool plot twist. And it's one of the most iconic scenes in movie history. It, you're just like, this is amazing. Such a great plot twist. Then you watch the prequels. And you know that Anakin Skywalker is Darth Vader. You know that Darth Vader's Luke's father. That iconic moment is killed because you know what happens. You know that he is uh, and Luke's Luke's father. You know Anakin's Luke's father because you watch the prequels. <laughs> what? Wait. So you're discrediting the prequels for existing at all? Never mind about the writing quality. I guess they exist. Therefore, they are bad. L O fucking L. Dude, you can watch these movies in whatever way you want. People who grew up watching the prequels didn't give a shit. Hell, I didn't give a shit. Chances are, if they grew up with the prequels, they were five or six anyway. It was their parents introducing them to Star Wars by watching the OT first. Yes, the Vader twist is very cool, sure. But I'm not butthurt that I didn't get to experience it organically. Hell, if watching the OT first, experiencing the Vader twist organically means I could have possibly turned out like this? You didn't like it. No, I, I think I deserve a public apology from George Lucas. Or even worse, like this? Then thank fuck I watched the prequels, because I still have the ability to put forth an argument of fucking substance. That kills a big part of the originals. If you watch this in order and you watch it like a brand new Star Wars fan, you know what happens, and that iconic moment is killed, and that is another reason the prequels are not that great. Another bad thing was, she lost the will to live. Are you kidding me? Now don't give me the whole Sidious killed her, because there's no proof of that. You can sit here and argue with me that all day, but Sidious, there's no proof in the movie or the books that Sidious was the one who killed her. Stupid scene, she lost the will to live. That is the dumbest, dumbest plot point I've ever heard, and should be removed from the movie in general. Finally, Star Wars only. You put forth a decent argument and you refute an argument that for this scene, I personally disagree with. Yes, the circumstances of Padme's death based on the knowledge I currently possess is a poorly written plot twist indeed. 
and unnecessarily complicated. I personally would have thought it would have been easier to just have her die due to perfectly feasible complications while giving childbirth. If I didn't know any better, I'd say Lucas wanted to drive home that this was indeed a tragedy of love, not a tragedy of chance. And this tragedy was ironically caused by Anakin himself, which is what he gave up everything to try and prevent in the first place. Again, poorly written, but the scene's execution on camera was damn near flawless and heart-wrenching, beautifully shot, and Lucas's signature intercutting of scenes only served to enhance the moment. Now I could talk about how Revenge of the Sith ended in a rushed manner where it had to be set up for A New Hope. I could talk about how they try to get the characters into position for it and whatnot, but uh, it's, just, it's just, I'm being a dead horse here, guys. That's not a big plot point. It's not a one that really matters. It doesn't help the story. It kind of brings it down a little bit, but nothing where it's like, oh my god, how dare they? It's just kind of like, oh wow, you guys really rushed into that, whatever. So, do I like the prequels? No. I'm sorry, I don't. I First of all, no. It's not beating a dead horse. Hell, I made this two years after your video even aired on YouTube, and I've added plenty. There is more you can add to the discussion. There is always more. You just need to take the time to construct good arguments. Secondly, there is no real big deal with the rushed ending of Revenge of the Sith. Because yes, I agree, it is rushed, but that destroys the argument that Revenge of the Sith is boring, when more happens in this one film collectively than in any other Star Wars film. I, I'll tell you which ones I can watch. Phantom Menace, whoa, 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 are you kidding me? Are you kidding me, Star Wars only? The Phantom Menace, that's the worst one. Eh, I disagree. I like the action in that one. Um, I, I like seeing Liam, Liam Neeson on the screen. I love Liam Neeson. And I like seeing Ray Park and Ewan McGregor go at it in the lightsaber duel at the end. That's amazing. I've met Ray Park, so kind of, I guess it gives it a little more credit for me. So, I like the Phantom Menace more than I like the Tackle Clones. Tackle Clones, forced love story. Boring. I skipped through 90% of it just to get to the action, and the action's not even that good because Obi-Wan, uh, Anakin, and Count Dooku are at a rave party when they're fighting. So, yeah, whatever. Uh, Revenge of the Sith, I can watch. <clears throat> Good action. Uh, five lightsaber battles. Kind of interesting. Uh, not too bad of a uh, of a plot, I guess you could say. It was. It's just. It's. It's not the worst one. It's the best one out of the prequels. Overall, though, the original is still better. But you're one hundred percent entitled to your opinion. But in all honesty, based on your own words, it would seem your opinion basically comes down to I want action, and that's it. Ooh wow. What an opinion. People are going to get mad at me for this video, but I want you to answer me this one question if you think the prequels are really that good. Go right ahead. I'm all ears. We are all ears. If the prequels were that good, why do they divide the Star Wars community so much? Answer that. Because if you think about it, the originals, everyone gets behind them and goes, yeah, those are good. But you get behind the prequels, you got someone else saying they're not that good. So if they're really that good... Why do they divide the Star Wars community? That's not what Star Wars is about. It's about bringing us all together and uh, us agreeing that we love it. Because the OT fanboys didn't get something that fit their vision of what they thought Star Wars should be. So they decided to throw a bitch fit about it all over the internet and force their perspective onto everybody else. So much, in fact, that people are such pussies they won't even dare say a positive thing about the prequels without immediately begging the OT fans not to attack them. This internet hate gave rise to a famous line I've seen amongst the comment sections on YouTube, which is nobody hated the prequels until the internet told them to. There's a reason now that people are rallying behind the prequels, and that's because those people, like myself, have grown up, and now we have a platform to call out this echo chamber of bullshit circulating the internet. People say it's because of The Last Jedi that the prequels are getting more respect, and that's partially true. But what The Last Jedi has also done is expose the prequel haters for how pathetic they truly were back in the day. But the reason I say it's only partially true is because the prequels were never bad to begin with. A large majority of fans have always felt that way, and they are only now comfortable to voice their opinion freely without getting attacked. The prequel era was a very exciting time for Star Wars fans. It didn't divide anybody. Most people who grew up with the prequels love all of George Lucas's Star Wars movies. The prequels didn't cause a split in the fan base. Just a couple of unsatisfied, butthurt, fucking pathetic man-children did. And now we are all stuck with Disney, which is where the split really happened. Prequels don't do that. They do the opposite. They divide us. And that's not something Star Wars is about. But anyways, 
that's just my 10 cents on this thing, guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Comment your opinions about it and tell me what you think of my opinions and other people's opinions because these aren't all just mine. I had fun making this video, honestly, and it made me rewatch the prequels, sadly. So, but hey, like I said, just my opinion. I'm not the biggest fan of them, but I can watch them every now and then. So, comment your thoughts below. Uh, comment, like, subscribe. I'm Star Wars Only. May the Force be with you, always. And we are done, ladies and gentlemen. Damn, I, I had way more to say than I planned on. Pretty exhausted, in fact. So many retarded arguments to deconstruct. But I hope you had as much fun watching this as I had making it. And I hope you had a few laughs here and there. I know I did. Again, I got nothing against Star Wars only personally. Quite the contrary, in fact. My real issue lies with his bad arguments, rather than his opinion on the prequels. You can dislike the prequels all you want, but disliking something passionately doesn't automatically make that thing objectively bad. And yes, that goes for The Last Jedi as well. You can't just say that it's bad. You have to say why, and you have to prove it before actually declaring that it's bad. At least in terms of objectivity. And with all that said, I will leave the video there, and I hope to see you all back for Revenge of the Prequels Episode 3 for however many years it takes me to make that one. Because I'm really bad at keeping to a schedule. So yeah, thanks for watching. I appreciate your time. As always, I'm the Anomaly, and I'll be back with more videos shortly. The main thing is to protect these characters. Make sure that they still continue to, to live in the way that you created them. I sold them to the white slavers. Star Wars The Phantom Menace was the most disappointing thing since... <laughs>